have our uh, speaker today uh, come all the way from California. Uh, Ron Rice is um, the author of chair um, in social effects with mass communication at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, Ron is also co-director of the Carsey Wolf Center for Television, Film, and New Media. Now, I know there are quite a few people in this room from many different disciplines, Dan Kelly from Information Science, and uh, several of you, uh, Dan Wright, uh, Dave Weaver, Don Shaw, many of you who know Ron personally too, and most of us are very familiar with his work. Uh, Ron has been a pioneering figure in um, not just mass communication and uh, disciplines related to communication, but also an academy of management, and his work is also one which has reached many people in information science. So one of those people who is heavily cited in not just our field, but also encompassing some of the related disciplines too. And his research interests are quite eclectic and diverse, spanning so many different areas, looking at it in terms of public communication, scholarly communication, uh, looking at it in terms of some regulatory issues, looking at it in terms of just about every aspect of new media, so to say. And today we talk about new media, but Ron was really talking about new media when new media was actually new. So we're talking about it almost from like 20 years ago or so. And not surprisingly, uh, his, uh, one of his classic books, um, uh, the New Media book, it's called The New Media, uh, that is among the most cited books, uh, not just in our field, but again, uh, just about every discipline which talks about the impact of communication technology. So this is something which, um, and, and his scholarship has been pretty prolific, besides having advice close to over 25 PhD students um, during the last 25 plus years. Uh, Ron uh, has also authored or co-authored or edited um, 11 books, and just about over around 150, 200 uh, different articles, both journal articles, book chapters, the pre proceedings. So um, he's going to be talking about some of his recent work. Uh, he's been looking at this from a particularly conceptual perspective, dysfunctional organizational feedback systems. And for those of you who follow, who are ICA members and read Journal of Communication regularly, this was a very provocative lead article uh, just a couple of issues ago. So if you haven't read that, you get a good flavor of that today, and I also very strongly encourage you to uh, take that. So without much further ado, welcome to Chapter Bell. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, it's a great pleasure and it's a great honor to be here. Uh, I grew up in Virginia and I was talking with him and I'd never actually been to UNC before until this trip. Uh, shocking. I realized I had actually been to Duke a long time ago to the business school. And I realize now I have a great gapping moral hole in my soul by not actually <laughs> counterbalancing my encounters with the axis of evil to actually come here and <laughs> cleanse my soul of that. Um, you are right to say that I have sort of an eclectic and diverse background, and that's a very pleasant and positive way to characterize my uh, indiscriminate academic promiscuity. Um, I sort of started out interdisciplinary inter when I didn't know that that was a term. Uh, I came to the Stanford PhD program with no background. I was an English major, and I'd worked as a corporate manager for many years. And I had, I didn't have a master's in communication. I'd never taken a social science course. I'd never taken an economics course. I didn't really know what computers were, even though one of the first computers was in the basement in Columbia. Um, didn't have any stats. I had no background at all, which completely freed me up <laughs> to actually learn things. So, and Stanford was a very, very uh, encouraging environment, and then I taught at Annenberg for seven years, which was also open, and then for 14 years I was at Rutgers at the School of Communication, Information, and Library Studies, and one of my faculty members at Stanford, William Pace, who was a, a researcher in information science, and several people from that program have gone on to be very influential in information science. So, Don Case, who's the current president of ACES, was one of my colleagues, and we co-authored stuff together, and Christine Boardman was, um, very, very major, is a major figure in ACES. So I have that background too, and I'm very comfortable and familiar with those things. So it's nice um, to be able to cross uh, boundaries and disciplines. And now, in the world of the internet, you have to. If you go to the Association of Internet Researchers Conference, first time I went there, every person you heard speak, you could not tell what discipline or department they came from. Because they're just talking about something that's really interesting from a lot of different perspectives. And I think that's, that's really the, the truth of where things lie. But on the other hand, you have these, these, these ordinary political and, and structural constraints. You have to have departments. You have to have criteria. You have to have some people sharing some common knowledge. You have to place the students in, in academic departments. You have to publish in journals. So this is kind of balance and, and mix of these forces, which, which I really like. So as evidence of that, I'm going to talk about something which has nothing to do with anything else that I've ever published before. And I know some people are here because they're interested in, say, 
communication campaigns and have done a lot. Oh, you're actually trying to track me, aren't you? Good luck. Um, I was wondering, I thought maybe she's really preoccupied with her little toy, and then I realized, oh, it's me. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that interdisciplinary background I wanted to, to state because this is an interdisciplinary uh, approach. And I've done that before. I, I had a book on accessing and browsing information communication. We looked at about eight or nine different academic disciplines to identify the concept <coughs> of browsing and access and then show how you could develop an integrated model from multiple perspectives. So I'm trying to do the same thing here. And um, so this isn't necessarily related to any of your research areas. And if you're an organizational communication researcher, you might feel a little more sympathy to this. But at the end, I want to say that this is probably pervasive. And, and if I'm at all successful in identifying some terms and some, some concepts, you'll begin to see that this is, in fact, pervasive throughout your regular personal lives, your organizational lives, and even your academic lives. And, and once you understand all of these concepts and begin to see this stuff, you will become even more depressed and crushed by reality than you are now. So I'm just warning you, now is your last chance to escape. Okay, so unusual routines. Um, I, uh, well you'll see, I was sort of inspired by an earlier work by Benjamin Singer called The Crazy Systems and Kafka Circuits. And I wanted to generalize that. And I worked with a doctor student, Stephen Cooper, who, who's a co-author on a book that's coming out of this. All I have to do is finish the book. Uh, um, and so I was trying to come up with a term that would capture the essence of this. And so unusual routines is intentionally oxymoronic. That is to say, it, it means kind of the opposite of what it sounds like. Um, it's unusual, this, this, this phenomenon is unusual in that A, typically, maybe not you, but somebody who's associated with the process experiences this as some negative kind of thing. So in that sense, it's unusual and it's not what you want. It's also unusual in that it's, it shouldn't happen. It's not just that something should happen that might have a negative consequence. It's that what's happening itself at the process level, when you think about it, it really shouldn't be happening. It's unusual. It's, if, it's not what somebody would have wanted to occur if they really understood it. The second word, so it's doubly oxymoronic because unusual is the opposite of routine, but unusual has two meanings, and routine has two meanings. It's routine in the sense that um, it, is, it happens systemically. That is, under the same stimulating conditions, it would happen again. So in that sense, it's not a idiosyncrasy, it's not random, it's not an error, it's not a mistake, it's not like somebody just dropped something or broke something. The system is designed to elicit this response. Now, it may be very, very infrequent. The listening conditions and the actual interactions of the system might be highly, highly infrequent. It might very rarely happen. But it's built into the system. So in that sense, it's routine. The second sense it's routine is that it becomes routinized. That is, it's sort of like, you know, on tree barks, if there's a little bug in there, it'll develop a little boil, right? It's a little bump on the tree. And that boil, that bump in the tree, is actually a protective device. It grows around the little creature that's chewing into it. And so it protects it. And uh, same thing as a pearl. A pearl, of course, is entirely built up to protect the uh, oyster from being irritated by the piece of sand, generating this incredibly beautiful and incredibly expensive thing simply as a protective defensive device, which is a really interesting phenomenon when you think about it. So, so routinization, these, 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 this procedure, this process, which is unusual, it's embedded. It thinks it accretes around it. It built up to support it, to recover from it, to work around it. Other people begin to respond to it. And it also becomes accepted. So in that sense, it becomes routine and routinized. So unusual routine. So these things, when you experience them, they may be unexpected. That is, your expectation is different from the response that you get. Now remember, the secret is that it has to be systemic. That is, it has to actually come from the system. It's not just you walk up and somebody drops something by accident, and then you hit your head on the table, and that disconnects the computer. That's, I mean, that's just, it's ordinary, but unfortunate. It's unexpected, but it's not systemic. Right? Um, or it can often be contradictory, but it can be contradictory at different levels by different actors. That is, what you do makes sense, and what the other person does makes sense, but the interaction between you generates a contradiction. Or something that you do now generates a contradiction at a higher level of the, of the organization, or later on in time. So the contradictions are not obvious, and that's one of the problems. 
the more complicated systems get, and the more um, loosely coupled and over time, temporally coupled, um, the contradictions occur uh, in dislocated entities, and so you don't know that there's a contradiction going on. That's why we have the linear routine. Um, one of the things that involved these is a deviation amplifying loop. That is, there's a system, like we have, you know, you know all the examples of thermostats in the room right there. So it's set for a certain range, and within that range, it usually allows plus or minus one degree variation. If it gets colder or hotter than that, then it's outside the range, the system will come back and either produce heat or cold and bring it back within that acceptable range. It's not, it's not designed to hit exactly a specific temperature because then it's always going to be hovering back and forth. It has some acceptable range of variation. So that would be a deviation reducing feedback loop. But if you had a system which, when it got too hot, it would tell the system to send more heat in, that would be a deviation amplifying loop. So when I was at Stanford, there was a very, very famous uh, couple there, Nathan McAbee, you probably know Nathan, right? And uh, his wife, um, gosh, uh, Ellen. Ellen, yeah. And uh, he told the story as an example of a deviation amplifying feedback loop was, uh, they had a nice cottage in Merced, in Northern California, which is kind of chilly, and one time they got the electric blanket controls confused, and he had the control for her, and she had the control for him. <laughs> And so, oh, it's getting hot in here. I think we'll turn it down. And she's like, oh, God, it's getting cold in here. I think I'll turn it up. And so, like, he's frying. <laughs> uh, so that's, a, that's an example. Um, and what happens is that uh, because these uh, feedback loops uh, don't send the right signal or there's no feedback loop at all, and we'll talk about that, that the system can't learn. Okay, so in the organizational learning literature, we have this thermostat thing. We call this single loop learning, which is it gets outside the range, the system correct, get back in the range, everything's fine. If nothing else changes, the system works fine. So that's what we call homeostasis. The second loop learning would be, well, we realize that this way of treating it, uh, heating and cooling is actually dysfunctional because it's generating huge carbon footprint. We actually have to design a new system. So we learn about that at a higher level, we actually change the system. That's the second level of loop. Well, in these unusual teams, one of the problems is you don't get any feedback or you get wrong feedback or you get delayed or incorrect feedback. And so one of the intriguing aspects of this is that you can be doing exactly what you're told to do, what you're trained to do, what the system either allows or requires you to do, and you actually may be generating local benefits. And so from your point of view, it's a perfectly functioning system. But because it's linked to other subsystems, in a social or technical system, it's generating these contradictory effects. It could be later, it could be delayed, it could be negative. And the system itself is either not sending back a signal to the original local system, or it's sending back some kind of either deviation amplifying or repeating signal. And that too is systemic. So it's not like, oh, I'm gonna send a message back. I'm, I'm gonna send a message back to, um, to Juliet that in fact uh, I am coming to you too. Or I guess it was Juliet's letter to Romeo. I'm gonna send you a letter that, uh, you know, I'm, it looks like I'm dead, but I'm not really dead. So come back and save me. And so they send the letter and then uh, Romeo's coming back and doesn't even get the letter because he passes the letter in, as the two horses go you know, past each other. So he doesn't get the message. He thinks she's dead, so he kills her, himself. She wakes up and goes, oh, Romeo's killed himself. Well, I must have killed myself too. So that's all because of a message that just didn't make it. That's not necessarily a flawed system because it's not built into the system, right? It was a mistake. Um, if he hadn't left on his own, then he would have gotten it and we would have never had to play. Um, so these generate other kinds of consequences to other actors at different times and different levels, and those may be both positive and negative. And so you may generate positive and negative, but positive uh, outcomes right here, but it's generating negative outcomes for somebody else in the system, and they often don't know where those are coming from because the system can't learn, so you can't provide feedback. And so you keep paying these negative consequences and you don't know why. So it's very confusing and very frustrating to So just as a tiny, tiny little example, in, in this book we have gazillions of examples. Um, when I was checking in the hotel here, which is a beautiful historical place, they give you those little hotel cards, right? Okay, <coughs> so it's a system. Everybody who checks in gets the card. You use the card multiple times a day. It's designed for lots of good purposes. It not only protects the room from being you know, broken into, but also they collect a lot of usage data. You don't know that, but they know when you check in and out of your room. All right, they give those cards out. It's supposed to help you. The card can be put in four different ways, right? This way, well, you know, it can be put in this way, or this way, or turn it over this way, or this way. So it can go in four different ways. 
It only works if you put it in one way, right? You have to have the magnetic strip up and facing you in this hotel. In other hotels, it's different. So it's variable across hotels, so you don't necessarily learn across hotels unless you're aware, as I am, that it's going to be possible for this to be an unusual routine. On the card, it doesn't tell you which way to put it in, right? If you look at the card, if you ever check into that beautiful hotel. It's just a lovely card with a logo on the front and a strip in the back. There's nothing on that tells you how to put it in. So it's generating, just by random chance, three quarters of the time the card's not going to work. The system has designed its own system, which is designed to protect you and benefit you, a built-in error rate of 75%. Now, I happen to know that it's possible. When it didn't work the first time, the red light goes off. I know oh, it's probably not the wrong card. I probably just have to go the other way. But most people will say, oh, it doesn't work. They have to go back down to the front desk. The front desk person says, oh, that's strange. It seems like it's fine. Here, let me make you another card. And you have to wait in line for that. And you have to make other people wait. They have to generate more cards. You come up there, and maybe it'll work next time. And, and maybe it'll work randomly, because you're putting it a different way person downstairs feel they've now solved the problem because it was idiosyncratic just do just your card. The system doesn't learn. The next person comes in and gets their card, generates the same series of errors. Now that's a very, very small, tiny example. But you begin to see that these pervade your life. <coughs> I'm here to cheer you up. One of the local negative effects of these unusual teams is to generate what Singer called Kafka circuits. Now I'm sure many of you are fans of Franz Kafka. Have you read Kafka stories or short books? Those of you who are more jaundiced about the human condition would have been the people who have read those books. Um, but pervasive throughout his book to people trying to understand why they're being blamed and no one seems to know, but everybody's acting as though this person, because they're trying to find out if they're blamed, they must be guilty. So um, these unusual routines generate these circuits. That is, trying to respond to the unusual routine generates an additional cost, often which is greater than the problem in the first place. So a work circuit. If my card doesn't work, I now have to go back down the stairs. Just at the time, I probably get late, you know, late at night. I got my luggage sitting there. I'm really tired. I'm pissed. I have to now spend more time to go back down. And I'm generating more work for the person behind the desk. So, all of a sudden, you've generated a second series of activities, which are wasteful. A delay circuit. Um, we can't solve well. <laughs> Sri's telephone, his apartment phone line, they were doing some construction, the cable company cut the phone line by accident. And um, uh, he can't call other people because he's spending a lot of his time trying to contact these people to fix his phone line. Um, and they don't have a process for dealing with it, which is bizarre, because how many times do you think the cable company has cut phone lines in their experience? And so everybody is getting delayed in trying to solve this problem. An error circuit is when actually trying to solve the problem generates a secondary error. So like credit card, uh, I mean uh, credit report, when you try and go to fix them, it makes some other kind of error which now gets into your system, and you have to spend not only more time and energy, but also other purchases that you're trying to get encounter a credit report error when you try and do it. And then the blame circuit is um, you try to solve this problem, and you end up either getting blamed for it or getting blamed for being cantankerous and difficult. So if you learn about this stuff and then you go back to the, to the clerical person, it's very important. They're doing their job. They're not trained or, in fact, not very tolerant of or rewarded for processing meta-communication. You're coming back and saying, I learned most of the have to say this. I had a problem with my card, but it's not the card. I know it's because da da da, the, the arrows and the, okay, they don't want to hear any of that, right? So the response is, A, this guy is another one of those cranky, spoiled travelers, right? And he probably bent his card, or worse yet, he probably put his card in the same pocket as his cell phone, <coughs> which generates frequencies which will wipe out magnetic strips. So they're blaming the customer for generating what's now a new exceptional uh, problem which was, of course, generated a problem that was systemically built into the system, which they didn't know about, but they're the only person in any position to actually deal with it. I like lots of visual aids. So anybody here a Dilbert fan like I am? My students demand that I use Dilbert cartoons in order to come. Alice, your problem is you take on too much work. Your problem is that you give me too much work. 
Your second problem is that you blame others. And your third problem is that you're always angry. God, it's all you. So here's already, there's like, you know, once you develop these terms, you can take a Dilbert cartoon and you always build in at least one or two uh, feedback loops for this one. All right. In the long run, these are going to generate lots of other consequences. First of all, because they're pervasive. Second of all, because they're layered. And third of all, they generate negative consequences in ways that can't be tracked. And, and these escalate over time. So um, there's a whole literature on workarounds. Les Gasser did a really interesting article a long time ago on workarounds. You might, uh, the opposite of a workaround is the old union trick of working to rule. You know what that is? What's working to rule? In the old days, there'd be a lot of union people in this room, but in our fragmented, rationalized society, nobody's a union person anymore. Anybody a union person? Not How's here. it? No, working to rule means? What's the specification? What's the specification? What's the specification? Yeah, so the union says, you're not treating me right. But I, there are laws, I can't go on strike and I can't sabotage, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. If you're going to really enforce this contract in a way that's unfair to us, we're simply going to follow the contract. We're going to do only what our job tells us we're supposed to do. Within a day, the entire company shuts down. Because in fact, most of what gets done is all this extra stuff that makes things work. If, if you only did the job you were told to do, you, nobody else would be able to do their job with you because you're not solving all these problems. So people develop workarounds to actually get work done, to be more efficient, but become localized, the organization doesn't learn, they become embedded as well. So it generates these workarounds which are locally possibly useful, but globally quite harmful to the organization. Many, many of these other kinds of things. Who's in charge, we don't know. He called back the cable guy. The cable guy basically says, I don't know what you're talking about. But you're the company that cut my phone line. Well, we do not provide phone service. So he called the the apartment building, but they didn't install it. Called the at t Well, it, we don't own the lines, and they cut it. So nobody can you know, to take responsibility. All the way up to um, litigation and crises, I mean, things like Bhopal or the Challenger disaster. These are all results of accumulated unusual routines, little local things that don't get provide feedback that generate larger and larger consequences. Uh, so I've already discussed a lot of these kinds of things. And so one of the blame things is if you ever go in the situation of trying to in, explain something to an to a organization representative, you can hear things like, well, it was just a mistake, or this is an exception, or you, know, you get the sense that they're complaining, or they say, it's the computer, or it's not my job. These are symptoms of an unusual routine because um, in a sense, none of these things is true. But it's the only way the local person can make sense of it because they don't see all the frequent occurrences, and since they don't know how things are interle interlinked, they can only see it as a, a unitary exception. It's only unless you have a larger thing, you collect data on this, you see a pervasive problem, where you can actually analyze the system, you begin to see it systemic. Now, one of the systemic problems is the person who's the, the person at the desk, the, re you know, the retail representative, is, of course, the lowest paid person in the organization, typically. Which, if you think from an interface design point of view, if you're in the information science school, I mean, the interface is, in fact, the, the entryway into the organization. And you have to design that specifically for the user. They're not going to know or care about anything behind that. So the organization, these huge, massive, multinational corporations, are uh, spending the least amount of money on the person who interacts with their customers the most. When these people are confronted with this feedback, which they can't understand, they have no authority or a way to communicate that back to the organization, they're not put in a very difficult situation, highly stressed. And most customers, of course, are not going to respond in any kind of articulate way. They just think it's a mistake or something physical. And all. So they're going to have natural defensive routines, which will actually make the other person a lot, a lot worse. And this, there's never any information that goes from here beyond. So occasionally, I'll have these kind of conversations. Something will go wrong, and we'll solve it. And then I say, OK, before you hang up, let me just and ask you just to, and you don't do anything distorted. I'm not talking about you, I'm just going to talk about the process. You know, how could this be? Is there any way for you to find out? Da, da, da. It's like you're talking Martian. Because it's not part of their job. They're not responsible. They're being timed to deal with that next customer. I mean, it's a terrible, terrible design. They get a lot of price for it. What are some of the basic causes of a new routine? Well, one of the common ones is conflicting goals. So. Um, the reason that he called them Kafka circuits is that in books like The Trial of the Castle, you're supposed to be doing something, but you're also supposed to be doing something else. And it turns out if you do one thing, you're punished by the other one. 
So you're actually supposed to accomplish goals which are inherently conflictual. Now in most cases, the interesting thing about the unusual routine is, is that the source of the two conflicting goals don't know that there is another source and that their goal is conflicting. So they can't, when they do that, they don't know that they're putting you in that position and when you come back and say, for some reason, you know, I'm not doing what you wanted, they don't know why. They just think that you're not satisfying their goal. But you're in the situation where you have multiple goals to satisfy and they're, they're opposed to each other. The simplest case is um, quality versus efficiency. If you have an organization that has multiple organizational initiatives or two different, like marketing department that deals with the engineering, which is a common joke in Gilbert. Um, if I really want to provide quality, I need to have a lot of personal time with my customers. Same thing with teaching, right? I mean, the state legislature thinks that teaching is basically a manufacturing job, and they want efficiency. They want a lot of students through. The more students in your class, the better, right? Because you can teach more students, and that's more teaching. But if you really wanted to be a good teacher, you'd have one student. Well, maybe the student wouldn't think that that was good teaching, but uh, you'd want to have fewer students. So these conflicting goals and your behaviors in responding to the system are going to be different, and they're going to be at odds with each other. If you can try and maximize or even optimize or even improve quality, depending on the situation, your efficiency will go down. And so you might get punished. Now it turns out that in some cases, having multiple conflicting goals it actually is an intentional organizational strategy to generate competition. Uh, internal competition in Microsoft is it's managed specifically to do that. But most of the times you don't know that, it's very paradoxical. Um, so uh, these come from different subsystems, they generate different goals, they're different signals, different rewards, different punishments, and the person in the middle uh, doesn't often even know this is what's going on. So that's one source of these problems. So here's one. Uh, remember, quality is our top priority, pointing to a PowerPoint, which is pointing to a PowerPoint. Question, is, is it more important than safety? Oh, I forgot about that one. Question, is quality more important than obeying the law? Well, probably not. If we could maximize shareholder value by selling lower quality items, wouldn't we have a fiduciary responsibility to do it? Hmm, I'm sure it's in the top four. What if we had to lie to achieve quality? <laughs> and it goes on. So that's one of the things Dover points out, uh, Adam, that, that uh, often there's these multiple conflicting goals, and when you actually are explicit about them, they appear really stupid. The second cause is poor feedback, and I've been thinking about this a lot, and it turns out there's really two poor feedback loops. It took me a while to kind of figure this out. Um, there's the poor feedback loop which generates the poor job design in the first place. Bad system, bad training, bad information to the customer, uh, bad supply, whatever. Whatever creates the problem in the first place. And since the people involved in creating that local process, that local subsystem, don't really know that they're involved with each other in creating this, they can't really learn about it. So if there was good organizational learning, even though the initial problem was created through poor feedback, there could be feedback about the fact that there's the problem. And at the second level, there could be poor feedback about the problem. There's poor feedback. See what we're getting? But in true unusual routines, the second level poor feedback, the se second level feedback is also poor. And often in different ways than the first level poor feedback. So you can't even have corresponding dysfunctions. And so it's, you can't learn about the problem and you can't learn about the fact that you're not learning about the problem. Now one of the examples of this in psychological literature is the famous double bind, right? You're dependent upon your mom, your mom gives you mixed signals, you try to find the most to both of the mixed signals, you get punished for that, and you can't talk about the fact that you get punished for responding to mixed signals, but you're dependent upon her, so you can't escape. Traditionally, they thought this was a great source for schizophrenia, because it's the only way you can deal with two completely alternate realities which compete with each other, so you just basically bifurcate your own internal processing. Um, so this is sort of an example. So there's a lot of uh, double binds um, in organizations. So you can see that you know people get uh, stressed out. Uh, the client can't complain to the organization. The organization can't learn from that. And often the actual sub-processes and the goals get redefined to meet what is being satisfied. And so over time, the very nature of the organization's feedback 
generates a system which reinforces the initial problem. Because that's the only way it can make sense of this. It creates a satisfying second level feedback loop that institutionalizes the first level problem. And there's a lot of literature that discusses this in organizations. The third uh, cause is uh, what's called symbolic uses and manipulation. Um, this is one of the areas that gets into the question of intentionality. So some people say, well, are new, unusual routines intentional? Well, sometimes they are, but in fact, the interesting case is that mostly they aren't. Because right? if they are, then either somebody is um, badly trained, psychotic, manipulative, um, deviant, um, or authority figure who doesn't want to be challenged. But most of these are, are done by good intention people working in complex systems that just generate these systems. So one of the problems is that we think often of information, this is certainly a topic uh, more salient, I guess, to CELS, LIS, is that information provides multiple roles. And one is the content, and so we would say it's the denotated value. But the other is the kind of form, or the, the symbol, or the, the um, connotated value. And so information can be the information you ask to solve a problem, but the fact that I have the information, the fact that you're asking for the information, and the form in which I give you or don't give the information is also a message. And so there can be a disjuncture between these. So I can actually um, use certain kinds of feedback as a secondary message to you. And so I might encourage you to come to me. I have an open door policy. I want feedback. And you come in and I uh, control the conversation. I don't want to hear anything. So I'm trying to get you to leave in the first level, but not in the second level. Um, there's a whole literature on really interesting topics like organizational deviance, petty tyranny, a whole study of managers engaged in petty tyranny, uh, terms like routine nonconformity. So as you begin to look through all these other literatures, all this stuff pops out, but it's always been dealt with as just a local weird phenomenon rather than a general process. Um, some professions, like Karen Cerula did a really nice article on, um, I guess it's called routinized lying. So that in some professions, um, oh, did anybody ever see the David Mammoth movie, Glen Gary, Glen Ross? It's all about people just desperate to make their sales quotas or they lose their job and they're overextended anyway. And they get very quickly socialized to engage in manipulation of their customers under a huge pressure from the managers who are under huge pressures from their organizational headquarters to meet their quotas. And so she studied this in the real estate industry, and people very quickly kind of migrate over to an area which is at, at least questionable and often uh, illegal. And everybody begins to justify it because it's the only way to succeed in that profession. So there's all sorts of institutionalized um, processes whereby information is manipulated symbolically as well as in the content in order to meet these other goals, like professional goals and efficiency. There's other aspects about cultures. If you're in a risk-averse culture, you're not going to challenge, you're not going to try new things. A lot of literature on that. Um, there's a whole subset of literature that talks about this specifically in the context of information systems, information technology. And there's a lot of case studies of those kinds of things. And uh, Bob Smudge did a very nice uh, chapter in the 1990 book on um, organizational communication and organizations and communication technology. And he showed that as systems become more and more sophisticated, more and more complex and interdependent, there's more and more opportunities for deception and manipulation. So the fact that messages get stored until they're delivered and then read, that asynchronicity, actually allows them for that time flow to be manipulated. I can make up some story, take advantage of the fact that you may not get the message as soon as I get it, or I can pretend like I didn't receive it or as there's more messages that get filtered and synthesized and digested and sent on, the accountability for the original message gets more and more distanced, and therefore people don't take responsibility for it. So there's many, many more opportunities both for intentional manipulation and deceit, as well as just sort of systemic byproducts. And uh, uh, Singer and, and uh, Lee Thayer and others have also made the same kind of argument. So um, here's an example. Can your department do this for us? No problem. Really, it's outside of your normal scope of work, and I know you're overloaded. We're a flexible, client-driven organization, so here's a symbolic goal. Wally, how can I avoid projects that are outside of my scope of responsibility? 
fearfully accept the assignments and then never work on them until we're followed. But notice here, intentional symbolic processing. It's the same thing as the boss is doing. The only difference is the boss doesn't know that that's what he's doing, whereas Wally is. Think of Wally as basically a black belt, black belt in semantic judo, if you, if you see what he, he says. He knows everything that's going on. He uses the implacable bureaucratic weight of the organization to throw itself, and he just walks away from this panting, whimpering body that doesn't even know it's been thrown. It bolsters your claims of being overloaded while leaving you free for work that matters. Work matters? Well, not to us. <laughs> I'm not even sure what they want. I'll start ignoring it immediately. <laughs> so he doesn't really understand. I mean, he, that's what he knows that Wally meant, but that's not what Wally said. So he's not even engaging in the feedback loop correctly. Because he says, cheerfully accept assignments and never, never, then never work on them. But you don't tell them that you're not going to work on them. So there's all sorts of things going on. So that's a good example of symbolic communication. The fourth sort of general category of causes is uh, barriers to perception. There's lots of reasons why it's just difficult to see these things. And one of my goals is to uh, begin to define a language for this kind of stuff so that we're more able to see them and therefore less likely to become victims to them. Now, most of the times, if you identify these things and try to deal with them, you're not going to get any of that because the other person doesn't see it and the system was designed not to respond to you. So I'm not necessarily sure it makes you happier. It's just that you know where the source of your unhappiness comes from. And from a deeply philosophical point of view, that to me is its own small achievement. So there are certainly in organizations all sorts of mechanisms for processing complaints or feedback loops. And some of those are actually quite proactive, and they really do want to learn. And most of the recent literature on customer relationship management, there's a great book in 1990 called Virtual Corporation by Davido and Malone, and their principal argument was, not only do you have to accept, you have to seek out complaints, because these people are providing the manager insight for free. And if you find out as much as you can, your organization will be better, and they'll actually be more satisfied customers. And that got me into this huge literature in consumer behavior. There's this fantastic journal. Here's the title of the journal. I mean, all you have to do is hear the title, and you know you want to read it. It's the journal of consumer complaining and dissatisfaction. <laughs> Isn't that great? They have a whole journal just on that, and it's not a joke. I mean, they study word of mouth, dissatisfaction in restaurants, hotel management, things like that. Um, so some organizations really repress this. They don't have callback numbers. They don't train their retail clerks uh, to actually have any way to take a note on anything that's wrong. Um, uh, also, the much more sociological issue that they were argue that as organizations get bigger, more bureaucratic, and more formalized, they naturally go into more deviation kind of behaviors, and they naturally shut down feedback because they're just too complex. So a whole sort of critical arguments against bureaucratization, uh, corporatization, efficiency um, also come to play here, is that the organization, after all, is designed to be efficient. And the way to do that is to find the boundary pretty clear between internal and external. And if you come inside the boundary, I'm going to take care of you. And uh, if there are any exceptions, I'm going to hope to expel you back outside the boundary or redesign the boundary to keep you out. And that's perfectly reasonable at that level. That is, you can't afford to satisfy every single customer's every single need. So some companies will provide more resources, like anybody here, Nordstrom's fan, or all egalitarian academics, so you would never admit to it, right? <laughs> but some people are willing to pay more money, go to Nordstrom's because you get much better service, and that's what they're designed to do. Other people like to go to fast food restaurants, go to McDonald's. They don't want anything. They, they want to know exactly what's there. And the organization is designed to do that maximum efficiency. And the second you veer off, chaos ensues. Because they cannot process it, and they don't want to process it. They're not supposed to process it. So organizations have to constantly think, what is that boundary? There's a great study of um, concierges uh, and service people at the Ritz-Carlton. We have one of the highest level of customer service orientations. And they have massive training and socialization to develop all these ways and all this empowering ways 
each individual service person has their own personal budget that they can use on the spot to solve a problem. Because to them, maintaining the customer relationship is more important than anything else. They're always going to get the money back because after all, they're charging unbelievable amounts of money. But if I go to the level of that job tool, yes. No, is, it, is it really a role that much more people That's the problem. That's the problem. So outsourcing from this perspective would be appropriate when internal processes are very clear, when you can filter out exceptions, and when there's no ambiguity in the meaning of the service. Under those conditions, it may not be a bad idea. The trouble is it's often applied because people don't understand it. They just want to outsource. They, they believe the internal core competency versus the marketplace you know, service tool. And one of the best cases is outsourcing IT uh, solutions. I mean, IT seems to be the most external and technological, but as you know, it's the most contextual, the most subjective. Um, trying to make sense of what somebody's actually doing, I mean, it's impossible if you're the person doing it. You know, just, just watch yourself trying to solve a problem with your computer. If you were to stand outside and watch, you'd say, you don't have the faintest idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so yes, so that's a very good example. But there's these market pressures, and where's the trade-off? Maybe. Maybe what I can say is, yes, I'm going to piss off and lose maybe 4% more of my customers than if I do it in-house, but I'm going to save more than 5% of my money. And so an organization can perfectly reasonably make that decision, but I would say ethically if they also warn the customer. We are unable to provide the same level of service for more exceptional things than we did in the past. We apologize in advance, but you should just know this. But for those people who are reaching things, man, Follow the menus to get your stuff solved in five minutes. And 90% of the problems are those kinds of problems, right? The other thing is these become routinized, and as they're associated with technology, because people project rationality on the technology, right? If it's a computer, it's logical, it must be right. That's why the client, the, the um, retail person would say, there's a problem, oh, it's the computer. You know, somebody did that, I can't change it. There's, there's no human intervention because it's the computer. I was a computer programmer, so I always said, no, actually, someone could. You may not. In fact, the organization may not. Maybe nobody can afford to do it. But it's not the case that it can't be fixed. That's a different argument. You can begin to see that you don't want me as one of your customers. <laughs> <laughs> Unless everything goes right the first time. And then I'll know that, and I'll comment on that, too. So there's this whole language about the rationality of technology. People impose a rationality on technology just because it's technology. And therefore, if there's an unusual routine that's associated with technology use, people are going to be unlikely to associate the problem with people. Nor are they going to be likely to associate it as a problem. They're going to see it as something I did wrong. Because this is technology. Technology is right. If there's a problem, I must have done it. Uh, the reverse is also true, too, is that um, if there is a problem with technology and you're aware of this, you can say, no, if there's a problem with technology, then there's a problem with the technology. You have to go in and get that fixed. So a lot of times when I have a problem and I take it in, they say, oh, it's not working because something broke. To me, that's instantly satisfying because they know that it didn't work because the technology broke, rather than saying, oh, you don't seem to know how to use it, or we can't solve the problem, or we've never seen that before. Now, if you're like me, you're just an ordinary person, you're not doing anything weird. Now, some of you I know don't fit that category. Um, but if you're doing like really high level competing stuff, you're doing weird stuff, and so things will not work right. But I don't do anything bizarre. So if something doesn't work right, it has to do with the system. Because everybody's doing this. I'm not doing anything weird. The system was designed to do that. So something's a problem upstream. So this projecting an air of rationality makes it really difficult to critique it. It makes it very easy to blame and think it's an exception. And also, we don't, have, we don't know who's in charge anyway, so it doesn't even matter if we actually do it. And this, this also, because technology gets embedded in day-to-day -day life so much, that these things are part of normal life. So again, how could this be an error? I must be doing something wrong. Or you as the retail clerk, you particularly, must be a really bad day, right? That's why it's not the system. I would argue that your behavior in that is a result of the system that you're working for, right? You could argue that too. Um, oh, uh, another really interesting one is that everything is sort of distributed now, and, and you don't know who's in charge of what, and everything's so micro, everything gets fragmented. You cannot possibly understand the full interdependencies of the system that you're using. I mean, I don't even mean the technical system, I mean just the local processing system. 
And the person in the job often doesn't know that or can't know that or isn't rewarded for knowing that or isn't told that or isn't given an option to learn that. One of the jobs I had in my corporate life before I went to graduate school, another reason that I'm really interested in this stuff, I was a communication liaison at a statewide bank. And the problem was is that a federal or state regulation would change and therefore we'd have implications on the kind of money you could bring in and what accounts it would go into and how much time and what kind of manuals and what. So the information from the environment would come in somewhere in the organization. It would have to get to all those places where it mattered. And that meant in procedures manuals, in actual code in the programs, in how the teller actually dealt with this. But each person in their own little sub-process only gets the stuff that comes in, and they often even don't know where that is, and they don't know where their stuff goes. And so we actually had a department, this is highly unique, our job, we had about six of us, were kind of like ninja analysts, and we would just go around and find out how things interconnected. So when a regulation changed, we could actually find all the people who might actually be affected by this regulation. It was fascinating because I got to go and talk to everybody. And after a while, we became like the most highly valued people in the organization because if somebody wanted to do like a new budget thing, they would say, ah, oh, ask them, they'll know what, what matters. But because that job was not in fact associated with a, um, uh, what's called a profit center, None of those benefits of the learning could actually be accrued to us. They were invisible. The, or the local profit center might be doing better, but nobody knew why. And so when the recession came, this was back in 1972, um, a long time ago, uh, our department was the first department to get cut. Even though our department was the only department that had the job of making sense of information that came into the bank, which actually had implications for liabilities and things like that. So things get fragmented usually. I'm going to also critique, for those of you who are like Wikian sense-making fans, um, I, I certainly generally believe in the principle, but there's a, an unstated bias in Wikian sense-making that consensual sense-making through double interacts always leads to a solution which we react at, retroactively say makes sense, and therefore we go on our merry way. I would argue that because of all these layers of things and all these conflicting goals, that a lot of times you can arrive at something that's locally sense-making, which actually embeds larger nonsense making in the organization. So the sense making process is only local and therefore only local considerations are going to be going to play a role in that. And really strong consensual sense making actually going to build in these long term problems even firmer than they were before. So uh, that can be quite a problem. So here is kind of a, um, uh, this general picture of this double level of looping. So basically you have people, units, and processes that interact with each other. Oh, oh cool. Little beeping red dot. It will soon explode. Um, so in this can be multiple people, multiple units, multiple processes. You can have people interacting with processes and units interacting with units at different levels. So that's a whole other level underneath that. Well, in this interaction between the two, you have these possible problems. Conflicting goals, poor feedback, symbolic use of manipulation, barriers to perception, and sense, oops, this would be sense making. So there's an error, but it's not systemic. I don't always make that mistake. And I found it. Uh, okay, so you have that process. Now, to the extent that these aren't happening, then this process is usually pretty effective. And so as it goes out here, you might not actually have any problems. If that's the case, that's just fine, and you go on. But to the extent that these things are happening, if there's any problem here, this is going to make it impossible. First, it's going to make it happen, and then second, make it harder to see. And so now it goes out into the large organization and creates some kind of problem or conflict somewhere else in the organization for, for the consumer, right? Which is how we typically think about it. But I also want you to think about these as happening within organizations, too. So like an organization is an internal market economy and different units can generate negative externalities into other units and subsystems within the organization. And to the extent that they're networked, you could also generate negative network externalities. The more links that are associated through this system, that is the more successful the system is, the more you have this kind of problem, the worse these kinds of problems get. Because the success of the system propagates the errors even better. Okay, so these go out in the organization. Now, if the organization itself has any kind of problems, conflicting goals about how to solve problems or about how to communicate about problems, or if there's any manipula 
should there, heaven forbid, be any organization manipulation of symbols and status and meaning, or if there are barriers to perception, like this notion of uh, a cost center, right? The very concept of a cost center basically exiles all non fully explicit cost into shadow costs. They're, a, they're a sunk, they become pervasive dark matter in the organization that can't be identified and yet has this huge weight. Oops. To the extent that happens then, oh, um, that's going to feed back into the system and so you're going to have two things making the system work. First of all, these things, which are, if they aren't changed, this will become embedded and routinized and people are going to try and solve some local thing and make them better or worse and make them more uh, protected. The more protected they make, the less likely the organization will be able to learn about them and change them, and in fact, is going to find ways to actually reinforce this by power or uh, incomplete information. So there's really two places at which this happens, and that's why they become really, really very difficult. So an organization that knows this can happen has to change this first. Right? If you don't have really, really strong uh, feedback systems, learning proactive systems, you cannot possibly find these. These interact across. All right. Um, so this is ends at when? Two thirty. Um, it's eleven now. So it's, uh, it's five minutes to eleven. We've gone another twenty minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is so dysfunctional. We've actually gone backwards in time. So. <laughs> we actually have time to be very long, but some of the students will be leaving at three fifteen. And others are just sitting there. Um, <laughs> I'll just mention briefly. Now, a lot of that's kind of kind of assertion. If you're familiar with those terms, those cybernetic terms and other kinds of things, begin to make sense. You can see it's building up a model. But I want to also argue that there's broad literature which actually shows that there are huge problems, and the solution is okay. Let's make feedback better. It's like a classical thing. I'm like, well, the, the solution to the problem is we need to communicate more. And use communication researchers say, well, well wait a minute. More communication like that is not going to make things better, right? Sometimes less communication is much better, or fewer communications. Um, so I'm going to just mention that in a variety of ways, we can see that, <coughs> that there are certain problems with communication involving feedback, and there are certain organizational problems with feedback that actually prevent these things from getting solved or actually make them worse. And I would argue a lot of these are operating at both of these levels, so at the first level and the second. And I'm just, there's a ton of stuff I'm just going to mention. One is this whole argument about, um, turns out that when you look at problems and you say we need more feedback, all the information you need was already there. So there's something else going on. It's not as though, gee, we did this, it's the first time ever, we got a problem, now we get to go find information to solve it. The information is there, studies, in-depth studies have shown that stuff's right around there. And that has a symbolic factor. Maybe it's not, I don't get rewarded for actually looking for local information. If I want to avoid blame, I've got to get the solution from somebody higher up. Um, and some of this information uh, only becomes available by actually trying to solve a related kind of problem. So Van Hippel's done some very interesting work on this, and I'm sorry to say I misspelled his name. It's E-L, not L-A. Um, so that's one thing, is that feedback might be the answer, but in fact, it's not, because if it were, they already would solve the problem. Another one is there's a, um, a whole literature on feedback seeking. A lot of it's aligned with socialization literature. As people come into organizations, how do people learn about what goes on? Because the user manual that you get or the, the orientation manual it tells you almost nothing, right? It tells you, go to HR, and here's your parking spot, and don't set fire to your customers, and things like that. Um, but it doesn't tell you all this other stuff. So people actually have to find out a lot of information. And so they do it by feedback seeking. And some new recruits are better at this than others, and some organizations are better at providing this than others. And so um, getting feedback itself then can be dealt with with this literature. And the literature shows that, well, a lot of times it's not very successful. Maybe people wait for information to come to them, but since the other people don't know they're having that problem, because they don't have that problem, because they've been around in the organization so long that they've routinized the problem. They don't even see it as a problem. And so they're not gonna give you information. But you don't really know it's a problem because you've never seen this before and everything seems to be working right. 
and you're only doing what you're supposed to do. So you're not going to actually elicit feedback. All the information is there, but the two different perspectives prevent that feedback seeking from actually occurring. So a lot of this literature is certainly relevant to information science too, and there is a lot of uh, information seeking literature, not so much on feedback, some of it, but not so much. But relevance feedback is a particular form of that. Um, there's also interactions, like whether you have intolerance for ambi ambiguity, whether it's open communication, where you have support and trust in your supervisor. If you don't, uh, if there's less upward accurate factual information if, you're, if you don't uh, have a lot of trust in your supervisor, and so they don't learn about the actual problems. So that's one problem. I'm not even going to get into this. I'm just going to mention this whole literature called, called Coordinated Management of Meaning. Very, very interesting from both psychological, linguistic, and semantic point of view. And a lot of it has to do with that notion between um, sort of command and relation. So the Watzlawick and others talk about that there's two levels of communication. One is the sort of the content command, um, you know, here's this thing, and then the relationship. In the way that I say here's this thing, I'm also sending a message about here in my relationship. So at lunch today, we had a nice little discussion about uh, who was going to order what. And you were very kind to defer to me because in her culture, since I'm older, in any culture I'm older, um, <laughs> uh, she would defer to me. But in my culture, I grew up in Virginia, I defer to her because she's a woman and I've got a respect for that. Although now I know in our own culture that that can be seen as patronizing. So now I just basically don't interact with <laughs> um, I don't even eat lunch anymore. It's an order meal. I'm only a mail delivery guy. Um, so we actually talked about that, right? And so we we were commenting upon who gets to order first, but then we had this big discussion about <coughs> discussing who gets to order first. <laughs> Meanwhile, the waiter says, "Did you just order?" <laughs> but what's really interesting here is that. Um, they argue that unless you coordinate this process and you're aware that it's possible, you could be responding to a content or command statement at the relational level. And now you've got context switching. And that confuses everybody. They want just the facts. You're talking about relationship. You think they're not listening to you. You think they're not listening to you. And so they talk about all these different kind of crazy loops and charm loops and kinds of problems that occur with uh, mismatched content and context levels. So seeking feedback is not nearly as simple as you might think. You might actually think you're seeking feedback, but then you might be interpreting that as a relational challenge. Right? So they talk about a hierarchy of meaning, and if you're really uncertain, you have to go to the highest common level of meaning before you can come back down again. Nobody does that. They wouldn't even know how to do that. So there's this whole interesting literature on the semiotics of reflexive loops. How do you comment upon the fact that you can't comment on things? And at which level am I doing it? So this issue of um, each context or within the context of the other is what has to be dealt with. So a one-stage loop, which is the nature of the content is the actual relationship that we're actually talking about. And a two-step loop or more is the content of the relation refines or discounts the other. If I have a certain very high status awareness, if I have a, a high, if it's very salient to me to maintain a, a differential high status relationship, then when you present me with a content statement, I can discount that not by talking about the content statement, but by reinforcing the status differential relationship. I don't know that I'm doing that. I think I'm just trying to defer to my culture's norms. You're not so aware of that, so you think you're just missing the content, which further increases the status relationship difference. Neither one of us know that we're doing it. Unless you're intentional about that, and that's authority and domination. You know, I don't care what you say because I'm in charge. And, and uh, you know, just to make things healthier. But if higher order concepts and contexts are not immune from changes in lower levels of meanings. And so in some of these things that we've studied, we've seen that people are responding, trying to switch levels, but by doing that, they've now switched the relationship among levels, and they're even more confused people think that they're arguing about something, but they're really arguing about something else. So feedback doesn't help that situation. Um, can't. You can use the approved corporate font. Our corporate communications department says we have to use the Danville font. No problem. I'll buy the Danville font software today. There's a budget freeze on software purchases. 
So the Danville font is both mandatory and prohibited. Remind, you, remind me to ding you for negativity on your next evaluation. So here's a relational higher level context for this. I think I'll do some binge eating and nonstop sobbing in my cubicle now, unless that's prohibited too. No eating in cubicles. <laughs> so you have multiple levels of command going on uh, in, in response to a content, which of course is in response to a command. This is salient. I saved my department money when I first went to Rutgers a long time ago by ordering my readings ahead of time from the copy shop, and they rewarded me with 500 free business cards. So I didn't have to charge the department. I'm not sure they would have paid anyone. So I get these nice business cards, and Rutgers is red and stuff. One of my other faculty member, Brent Rubin, who was in charge of the leadership program at Rutgers, which was to train and cultivate leadership skills among faculty so they're doing more administrative stuff, also took sort of a corporate communication approach. And part of that leadership was that everybody would have the right professional card. So, um, as in most universities, the color is actually a very specific color, like the UCSB one. On my, on my um, flash memory, I had to actually get this. It was a blue and a yellow is a very specific, I think it's like 10 times 10. My business cards from the coffee shop were just red. They weren't Rutgers red, which was a very specific color. And it didn't use the Rutgers font, which was a licensed font. That is, you can't actually get that font anywhere else. So I thought I was rewarding the department by saving them money. I got in trouble from, uh, from Frank because I didn't have the approved Danville form. Um, there's a whole vast, unbelievably depressing literature on um, sort of dysfunctional group processes. And again, each one of them is kind of named separately because they think that this is an unusual thing and only occurs in this system. So there's also some really cool teams like a new routine using the language of these other people, a news routine may be obscured and unresolved yet the client's enigmatic episode, which has a very specific meaning, meets with an organization representative's value expressive ritual or a perfunctory ritual if the job is not personally significant. Now that makes no sense at all, but if you're in this literature, all those terms mean things, but they're never presented as though they're generalizable. They're always like a very specific kind of problem. Uh, there's also a discussion of a thing called Farragut, which is a particular kind of group dysfunction. Um, and I know none of you in the faculty have ever experienced this problem before. So let me explain it very clear, because it will seem strange and bizarre to you. Where there is one member who is somehow very troubling and problematic and irritating, but there's a norm of courtesy and respect, so everybody tries to figure out a way to avoid interacting and getting this, letting this guy, or woman, never women, always guys, um, disrupt of the group so that they can go on, but all they're doing is reinforcing this behavior which becomes permanently built into the group. And so the group begins to, to engage in very deviant and very um, strange kind of behaviors that don't lead to its goal because they're trying to constantly maneuver around this person. So there's one norm of academic courtesy and freedom of speech that is in direct contradiction with actually you know, accomplishing anything. And so there's this term called a farrago, which I looked up and does anybody know what farrago means? It's the mulch that's fed to cows. So sometimes it's grown specifically for that, sometimes it's uh, generated from other stuff, and cows need it and produce huge amounts of gas. But they need it in order to eat. So it's very nutritional, but generates huge amounts of gas. So these group functions are sort of like that. So this is the interaction between not only individuals' habits and tendencies, which can diverge from norms, but also the group's properties, its own values and its norms. And neither one of them accomplishes really what they want, but both of them are managing to continue forward. So in this case, because they're not constrained by the environment to really deliver or they become extinct, which is the case for organisms and businesses, you can argue, and this is true for bureaucracies too, which some say academic environments are, that their goal is simply to go on. And so if their, what seem to be local goals get totally perverted and diverted, in, 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 in um, an effort to avoid directly confronting this person, then that's okay. So that's a particular kind of group dysfunction that feeds on itself, perpetuates itself, and it has to do with different kinds of goals and nobody's really even willing to talk about them. There's another whole interesting literature on skills and confidence, um, which uh, both comes from Brian Spitzberg's work on the dark side of interpersonal communication, which is a fantastic book. 
And also, uh, Chris Agaris' work, which is fantastic in terms of organizational development, organizational change. And uh, this is sort of like the double bind applied to the subordinate managerial relationship. There's mixed messages from managers, from different managers, from different parts of the organization. The subordinates try and meet both of those, but the conflicting goals, uh, they get confused, they do the wrong things, they get punished, but there's also a status differential. They can't really talk about it. And so managers who think that they're very, very effective at one thing are actually highly incompetent at something else because they actually generate the opposite that they want. Now they have uncommitted subordinates who have no, take no risks at all because they're petrified they're going to do the wrong thing because they don't know what the wrong thing is. So, interesting here. This skill can be institutionalized, not just in interviews, leading to constant meetings where no just difficult decisions are made. Again, that's never happened in the factory world. Because, see here, the larger goal is not the actual accomplishing anything. The larger goal is continuing to have meetings with no conflict. That's the goal. <laughs> you laugh as though it's funny. I tell you, it's not funny. An so organization. <laughs> It would be me, probably. These are less of recognition. That's right, pains. It's sort of like when you have a rib injury and you laugh a little, and then which part of the laugh is pain. Um, organizational culture that cannot abide straightforward content. Think about it. Straightforward content is to be avoided because it automatically generates conflict, because it automatically forces people to recognize the discrepancy between communication levels. Despair and attribution by others of failure. So it's failed somewhere. It's failed here. It's failed in your behavior. And, and that, it doesn't come from outside. I mean, it does, but how you respond to it, too. And finally, it can lead to disaster. So a lot of the analyses of the challenge of disaster was that it wasn't necessarily technical failure. It was entirely a social failure. People knew that information. The engineers tried to communicate that. But there were all sorts of other goals, and there was the accretion of normality through NASA because they had so many successful missions that um, those risks were um, suppressed. There was no way to communicate about them. And uh, even the company, even Blackhawk, knew that this was not true in the end. So I mean, the paradox here, it's not like the company is forcing them to send these ships. So Blackhawk had nothing to gain by ships blowing up and killing people. Um, but this is a really good example to go back and analyze the, what, what went on and how the organization was structured. It was just designed to generate unusual routines, and it failed at that point. We're having a meeting to discuss employee retention. I always want to make a joke about fluids, but I won't. Um, tell them that employees quit because there are too many useless meetings. We won't be getting into reasons at the first meeting. Right? So here's what's going on. You're holding more meetings to tell them that they quit because there's too many meetings, but we won't actually be talking about them at this meeting. So that's a good example of that kind of process. Um, well, I won't go into this, but it's another just for some really cool stuff. I'll ask the vendor for ballpark price to see if the idea is feasible. This is really good, and this is not unfamiliar. You can't talk with vendors until our change control board approves the project. But that would require cost-benefit analysis. And I can't do that without ballpark prices from the vendor. Just take your best guess, OK? That makes a message now, right? The boss can't do what he just wants to do. So I should make up a number so I can get approval to make a phone call and ask what the number should have been? <laughs> right, but first you need my approval to do the cost-benefit analysis. Will you approve it? I'll have to see the numbers. <laughs> now, Gilbert's so good as is good satire, we're making it so really explicit, but the reason we laugh is we see these processes all the time. You know, and you say, how could that be? So I'm actually developing both uh, linguistic markers of symptoms of unusual routines. And if you hear yourself or hear yourself think or say, well, how can that be? That's a sign that there's probably an unusual routine lurking. Because it doesn't make sense. There's a whole literature on organizational memory and how organizational memory is both stored or retained and also retrieved and even reused. So a whole knowledge management literature has some implications for unusual routines because if you can't actually retrieve information and if the information is distorted when it's saved, getting more feedback is not going to help you. So an unusual routine itself may be the repository of 
or the symptom of incomplete, mismatched, incorrect, or biased organizational memories. So you can think of sometimes an unused routine as an artifact. It's a completely unintentional and completely unrecognizable byproduct of flawed memory and feedback processes. So the feedback process itself is not the solution, it's actually the cause. There's a whole literature on organizational learning and about, well, is it better to routinize and build in stuff so you have an automatic response to novel situations, or you should, in fact, always keep them ad hoc learning, which means it's harder to respond because the memory routines aren't automated. So feedback can be affected by whether you have sort of automated uh, responses or ad hoc. And then finally, there's a, there's a large literature on um, customer response systems and how you design them. So again, for those of you in SLIS, uh, when you have interaction, how do you actually seek and encourage feedback? And you want that from your customers, but how much information does the customer want to give you and how much time and effort are they going to take to give you information that might help the organization, but it's not obviously going to help them. And it is in a way that actually makes it easier for them to do that. You actually reward them. So we can go back to the Davido and Matt Malone book. Um, they say you should actually you know, reward customers, and the best companies do. It's not just you know, raffle, I mean, you actually get a discount or you become as part of a special customer group um, with special sales and things like that. You want, to, you want to make it easy for them. You don't want to, in order to get feedback, make them engage in additional work delay or error routine, which is how a lot of organizations are doing. So you have to have multiple channels. Um, you have to have potential feedback dialogues that do not constrain content. There's a whole really interesting literature on forms design that many forms are designed in such a way just very, very specific to constrain input, which has to be done because the data in, uh, key punchers aren't going to translate or interpret. They have to enter the data right into the database. And so that form design itself limits anything but, in fact, the routine response. But what you're trying to find out about is the exceptional response. So you're actually designing out of the system the ability to find out problems in the system. I love this one. We don't give out parts anymore. We're trying to end the vicious cycle of reordering. <laughs> Would you mind filling out a brief survey of customer satisfaction? <laughs> That's great, yeah. I just want to ask a question. Uh, the rules and observ the observations you made about organization, is there a, uh, could, could they, as an organization goes from the small to bigger to bigger, is there a certain point That's a, very, yeah, that's a very good question. Is it inherent? Is it scale-free? Or is it an emergent property? Well, uh, Web, Web Weber and, and I probably would argue that it's emergent. If, for instance, if it's just one person, you might have inter internal um, uh, problems that might generate these like memory problems and processing problems, but you don't have interdependencies that you can't see. As you get systems that are larger and more complex, you generate more inter interdependencies that cannot even be identified and probably can't even be solved. And so you generate more things and you can't even find them. So I would argue the second. But let me finish, we're about out of time here. Um, oh, there's a really interesting literature on technological literature among consumers. Most people don't have the faintest idea what they're buying. Um, so, I just want to end here by saying that there are, I'm working on, a, from the literature, a bunch of things that maybe organizations can do to try and help them identify new routines and respond to them. And there's some standard stuff associated with information systems design, but then there are some other kinds of things associated with semantic processing, uh, rhetoric, fostering paradox, um, empowering employees, having alternative measures of success. Um, Define users is very wise. So for instance, we define our customers as external people who buy stuff from it, but now a lot of organizations taking a quality approach understand that everybody in the organization is an internal customer. And so you would apply the same kind of customer satisfaction and customer feedback services to other people in the organization, which of course is going to piss off other people in the organization because now you're evaluating each other. I'm looking at anything on co-creation, you know, like you've got all this, you know, like um, consumers helping companies design new products like BMW get get consumers help from maybe that you know dividing the security and safety yeah. components. Yeah getting beta beta users involved in product development but also at a higher level you get
customers involved in designing the customer feedback system itself, right? So I'm just, uh, there's a ton of other literature that I'm working on, more stuff than you can, I mean, it's just, it really is crippling. So I'll just end here with a kind of philosophical statement. The unusual becomes the embedded routine. The skilled response becomes the awareness blindfold. That is, the more you are skilled at processing things, the less likely you're going to be able to see new things. The innovative becomes the ineffective procedure. Something that's very new becomes workaround. And the reasonable becomes the irrational. Ritzer's work on the McDonaldization of society. His whole thesis is in this unbelievable drive to rationalize, routinize, and make everything efficient. It's generating huge amounts of irrationality at the, at the margin, as we all, we all do. So sense making is the narrative which you learn. So go forth and make sense.